United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Nathan. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Uh, for those of you who are visiting for the first time, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we, uh, or, or not for the first time also, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we're so glad to have you. All right, so uh, we've got a couple of announcements. If you turn your order of worship over to the back side, you'll see a few upcoming dates. Um, these have been, most of these have been on our calendar uh, coming up for a few weeks now, so I, I won't spend too much time going over them. I just want to make sure that y'all have these dates. Uh, we're going to have our uh, reminder for everyone who is on church council. Uh, on Wednesday, September 8th at 10 a.m., uh, we are going to be having our church council meeting. Uh, we usually like to have those in the evening. Um, this time, uh, schedules just couldn't get together, so we're going to have that one in the middle of the day. Um, it is certainly open, so if you are uh, able to, to be here and, and you want to, to, to participate uh, in that meeting, you're welcome to come. Um, and uh, Thursday, September 9th, that next day, we will be having our, our open space monthly gathering. Um, the topic is going to be on labor and wages, and, and in particular, the dignity of all labor, um, a thing that puts us together. So it's themed around Labor Day. Um, and then uh, we want to make sure that everyone has the District UMW event um, that's going to be held here at New Hope um, on Sunday, September 12th. And then also save the date for Sunday, September 26th for our fall concert with Dabo Glory and Stephen Harwood. So that's still on our calendar. We're very much excited for, for that. We'll probably be asking a few of you for a little extra help in setting up and getting things ready. Uh, so just be ready to, to be asked uh, to, to participate in that. So we're very much looking forward to it. Other announcements today? Okay, I do have uh, a couple of things. In regard to next Sunday, any of the women of the church are definitely uh, invited to come next Sunday afternoon. The meeting actually starts at 3 o'clock. Uh, we could use a little help, but there's some of you that didn't get to sign up that would like to. Um, we're supposed to have snacks available here. Uh, we're going to have like vegetable tray, fruit tray, and then have a lot of different kinds of cookies. So if you would like to help, I think we've got the veggie and fruit taken care of. If there's anybody that would like to help with cookies, just see me after church and I will sign you up to help with that. Um, also, just some manpower, uh, like I've got a couple of people to usher and a couple to be registration and help with silent auction. So I'll need a couple to help serve the food because we want to make sure that we just serve it to people since we've got people coming in from all over the district and everything like that and make it a little easier and a little safer, okay? Um, so anyway, that's next Sunday, and we'd love to have as many of you as, as we can. Uh, the other thing is, you notice for a couple of weeks I had the uh, prayer chain sign up. If you did not get to sign up because you were gone during those two weeks, see me because I'm getting ready to put together the uh, new prayer chain and try to get it uh, to where it'll function properly. All right, well, thanks so much. Um, and uh, are there other announcements today as we start to worship? All right, well, if there are no further announcements, you can turn back over to the front page of your order of worship as we uh, join together in the call to worship. The words will be on your bulletin and on the screen. We come to prepare the way for Christ. The hope of Christ the peace of Christ, the reign of Christ. We pray that God would enter our world and enter our hearts. We cry out together, kingdom of heaven, come here. And now let us stand and sing our opening hymn. It's in our yearbook. It's number 121 if you'd like to sing that way, or you can see the words on the screen. Let's stand and sing together.
remain standing as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. from the prophet Isaiah. And this is a reading that we normally don't hear at this time of year. We normally hear this uh, in, in our time of preparation for Christmas, the season of Advent. Um, so maybe today hearing it outside of the season of Advent will, will help us to hear it in a new way. So let's hear these words. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the, the rough places a plain. Then the, Lord, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Word of God for the people of God. Right. Thanks be to God.
way to, to do that. Uh, what a fun arrangement of that hymn, uh, bringing out the, the mallets. Um, I'm so sad that I didn't get the opportunity well, to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, we're getting that, that all put together. Oh, thank you. Well, our second gospel, our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. And this is also a, a story that many of us may be familiar with. Um, it is the, the parable uh, called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And we might have many ideas about what this parable means. It, but what I want us to do today is, while I read this, um, I want you to read it as if this is the first time that you've heard it. Try to set all the understandings that you have aside for a moment and, and think about what this would have been like to hear this for the first time without these preconceived notions, uh, without the, the kind of understandings that we've placed on it, to, to hear it for the first time and to, to um, be shocked and surprised by the words of, of Jesus here. So let's hear this parable. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and he found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you stand, standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, I ask that you open all of our hearts to the scandalous grace that is revealed in this parable. I ask that you guide my thoughts and my, my heart and my words as I preach this morning, and that you would open all of our ears to hear the word that you wish to be shared. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I've created a little bit of a problem for myself. Um, it's you know it's been a little bit rainy over the last few days, and and um, and then before that it was just like really hot. And so I I started the habit of um, when I let my dogs out in the morning, um, I don't I just don't want to go outside to help bring them in, and they don't want to come inside, right? They've been out, they love being outside, and they don't want to come back inside. Um, and so instead of going out and, and gathering them, I've, I've been uh, calling them in, and then when they look at me, uh, I've offered them a treat. <laughs> and now it's come to the point where uh, they won't come. In fact, yesterday I called one of them in, and he starts to run, and then he stops. He's like, oh wait, hold on. If I don't come in, I, I can get a treat out of this. Um, but, but then even worse, one of them is not as smart as the other one, I think. And, uh, and sometimes when I call her, she will come in and the other one will start to come in and he'll stop. And so then I'll have to offer him a treat. 
And so he'll come in and, and I'll give them, I'll, I'll give him a treat, and then the other one will look up at me with his big eyes, right? And I'm like, okay, all right, you can have one too, right? I didn't promise you one, but you can have one too. And then the one who I offered will be like, wait, you, you promised me one, now you're giving one to her, can I have a second one, right? And, and so now I'm, I'm ending up giving my dogs way too many treats. We've switched to carrot chips, uh, because like, that is like, like carrot slices, because uh, that is like, way more healthy for them. But it's been a problem, I've created a problem for myself, because even my dogs can sense when something isn't fair. It's not fair. In the Gospel reading today, Jesus tells a parable about a landowner who, who hires workers to help with the harvest in his vineyard. And he hires workers in the morning, then again at noon and at three o'clock, and, and then late in the day, five o'clock. And, and the twist. Now, now in parables, there's, there's always a twist, and, and in fact, you might even say that, that that's the point of every parable. Jesus tells a story that puts his listeners into a familiar setting, some, something from their everyday lives, something from their everyday lives, and, and because this setting is familiar, it's something they've experienced today, and, and us today, as we read, we think that we know where the story is going. But then Jesus twists it. He takes the familiar, and he makes it strange. The kingdom of God, he's saying, is, is both like this world and unlike this world. And so the stories that Jesus tells, they expand the realm of the imaginable, letting us see new possibilities for our world here and now. And the twist in Jesus' parables is usually scandalous to our worldly understanding, and none is more scandalous than the twist in today's parable. When it comes time to pay the workers, the landowner pays them the same. Not the same per hour, the same. The exact same amount. Unless we try to over-spiritualize it and try to make this parable less offensive to us, Jesus lets us know that the offense is the point. The landowner specifically arranges the line for payment. And, and by the way, it, it was Jewish law or custom at the time that, that you paid workers on the day that they worked. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 14 through 15 says, Do not oppress a hired hand who is poor and needy. Whether he is a brother or a foreigner residing in one of your towns, you are to pay his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and he depends on them. Otherwise, you may cry out to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. And so the landowner, who is here being a, a good Jewish landowner, arranges the payments specifically to reveal, not to conceal, but to reveal that the laborers were all paid the same. He could have easily paid the ones who had worked all day first and let them go away, and then, and then paid the, the ones who had worked only an hour last, and, and then no one would have been the wiser. But... He specifically arranges for those who had worked the least to be paid first, and those who had worked all day to be paid last. Now, we could all tell our, our own version and experience of this parable. We all know uh, someone who, in our not-so-humble opinion, neither or earned nor deserved what they got. Whether that was a, a job, a promotion, a raise, recognition, or, or maybe just happiness and success, you know, we may have experienced that, that we worked longer and tried far, harder, and it seemed to make no difference. More often than not, we view the world and ourselves and, and others, our place in the world, through the lens of, of secular fairness rather than divine grace. And that's the exact opposite of how God views the world and our lives. You know, we've been taught from an early age that, that fairness matters. You watch a bunch of children at play, and I'm sure that anyone who has ever worked in a school setting or who has ever been a parent has, has heard the words over and over. And before long, when kids are playing, someone will inevitably say, that's not fair. That's not fair. And it's not just children. Adults want fairness, too. And too often, however, our worldly ideas about fairness rather than love, acceptance, mercy, forgiveness, or generosity, 
become the measure by which we act and judge another person or, or someone else's life circumstances. We like fairness, I think, because it, it gives us a, a sense of, of some assurance of order, predictability, control, and, and even hierarchy, even if it's a, a false assurance. Fairness is based on what you quote-unquote deserve, or how hard you work, what you achieve, the way in which you behave. Sometimes it's fair to give a reward. Other times it's fair to give a punishment. We live and promote what the Episcopal priest from, from West Texas, Michael K. Marsh, calls a wage-based society. And he says that in a wage-based society, our secular ideology says that you earn what you get. You deserve the consequences, whether those are good or bad, from the actions that you take. But is that the only possibility for our world? Is that the best we can do? Every one of Jesus' sayings prompts us to reimagine our reality in light of another, the kingdom of God. When we pray the Lord's Prayer every week, we say the words, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God prompts us to ask the question, What would this world look like? If God were in charge, in charge of what? In charge of everything. What would it look like if God were in charge of our government? What would it look like if God were in charge of our businesses? What would it look like, most importantly, if God were in charge of our lives? That is, if, if God's rule and reign were made complete in our hearts. What would that look like? And Jesus, Jesus answered, is that that would turn the world upside down. As he concludes in the parable today, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Can I say that I don't like that? Is that allowed? Can I say that I prefer a gentler Jesus who, who tells sweet and comforting stories about heaven? Can I say that I'd rather have a Jesus who doesn't ask anything of me? Who doesn't make me confront my own values? Who, who certainly doesn't tell me that my personal over overdeveloped sense of fairness is misguided? A Jesus who doesn't turn the world upside down? Then I'd have to ask the question, what does it say about my own position in the world if I don't want it turned upside down? Because there are people all over this God-given earth who cry out every day, Please, God, please bring your topsy-turvy kingdom now. What happens, though, when divine goodness trumps human fairness? Well, then you get today's parable. Today's parable suggests that wages and grace, the ideology of a wage-based world and a grace-based world, stand in opposition to each other. They are two opposing worldviews. And the degree to which this parable strikes us as unfair is the degree to which our life and our worldview is wage-based. A wage-based worldview allows little room for divine grace in our lives, in our own lives and in the lives of others. Now, grace, grace is dangerous. It reverses business as usual. The last will be first and the first will be last. That is not how a wage-based society works. The world says that the last are last and that the first are first because they deserve it. It's what is fair. And our understanding of fairness, however, just doesn't seem to have priority in the kingdom of heaven, where grace is the rule, not the exception. Grace looks beyond our productivity, our appearance, our dress, our race or ethnicity, our accomplishments, our failures. Grace recognizes that there is more to you and who you are than what you have done or what you have left undone. Grace reveals the goodness of God. Wages reveal human effort. Grace seeks unity and inclusion. Wages make distinctions and separate. 
Grace just happens. Wages are based on merit. The only precondition of grace is that we show up and open ourselves up to receiving what God is giving. When we do, we begin to see our lives and the world and our neighbors differently. In the parable, the landowner goes multiple times to the market to hire workers, and at each time, there are people standing around, waiting to be hired. And in fact, the last time, the landowner asks them, why are you standing around? Uh, to which the workers quip, uh, and, and I love just uh, how sassy this must have actually been in reality, because no one has hired us. Why aren't you working? Because no one has given us a job. Now, if most of us, raised as we are in, in our world and in, in our society, you know, we, we might hear this and think, those no good lazy people, right? Why weren't they out working? And, and sure, that's a fine question to ask. Jesus elsewhere praises hard work and industriousness, and those are good things that, that should be encouraged. But the first people to hear this parable probably wouldn't have thought that these last workers to be hired uh, were, were not hired because they were lazy, that they were chosen last because they were lazy. They wouldn't have thought that. But think back to grade school during, during PE or recess, right? At the same time when, when everyone is shouting, that's not fair. And we, when you're going to play a game and, and you pick teams, right? Everyone's had this experience, I think. Some people get picked before others. And sometimes people get picked first because they are known to be good athletes, right? Uh, but other times, prejudice becomes a factor in, in which order people get picked in. Um, and who gets picked first and who gets picked last. You know, maybe an unathletic boy gets picked before a girl who is actually the better athlete. Maybe a kid gets picked because he's friends with the team captain. Maybe a child who isn't white gets picked last because of their skin color. Now, maybe that's not what happens today. I, I certainly hope not. Uh, but it's certainly what happened when I was in grade school. The labor market is often the same. Some people get picked last. Immigrants, women, and especially the olders of our society are often overlooked for jobs. And that's not even to mention the unemployment rate among the populations of, of people with disabilities, who employers don't even have to pay a minimum wage to, by the way. Imagine for a moment that, that the people left standing waiting to be hired aren't some group of lazy people, but a bunch of older people and disabled people who, who want to work, but no one will hire them. The world isn't so different today, is it? In God's kingdom, this parable shows that grace is the ruling principle. When the landowner pays the workers, he gives them each a denarius, which would have been just enough to feed their family for the day. And despite the protests of the first workers to be hired, the landowner insists that he has done the right thing. He has paid them, as Jesus says, what is right. And for Jesus, what is right is not what they deserve. It's what they need. A fairer world is a world that is without hunger. A fairer, a fairer world is a world with more equality, not less. A world in which people are given the opportunity to work and, through their work, earn enough to live on, no matter who they are or what their background is. And that's how we get to a world, in the words of Martin Luther King, that in which all labor has dignity. And yet, it all still seems ridiculously unfair, doesn't it? I think most of us probably feel like we are the ones in this parable who have worked the full day. And so we would want an extra helping of grace for ourselves. But in reality, aren't we all the ones who don't deserve it? None of us can earn grace. It is a gift from God. When you have been touched and changed by grace, when you have truly experienced it for yourself, the words fair and unfair they begin to lose their meaning. In the kingdom of God, fair means that everyone is included and everyone is cared for. So the next time that something feels unfair, don't ask, did everyone get what they deserve? Ask, did everyone get 
what they need. What they need to be healthy. What they need to be productive. What they need in order to live the best life that they can live in order to better themselves, their family, their neighbors, their country. So before we get angry when God gives others something that we believe they don't deserve, we should remember that the scandalous grace revealed to us in Jesus Christ is a grace, is a grace that none of us has earned. And yet, the good news is that God gives us that grace. What? Well, as this parable so disturbingly reveals to us, God is not concerned with what we deserve. God is not concerned with what we deserve. God is concerned with what we need in order to have life, to have life in abundance, and to have life eternal. God wants to give you whatever is right for your life, your needs, and your salvation. And whatever is right, the good news is, will always be more than what is fair more than what we deserve, more than what we could ask for or imagine. So how might we be able to move from a wage-based life to the vineyard of God's grace? Well, for one, we might start by trying to stop comparing ourselves and our own lives to that of others. We will create more room for grace to emerge. If we refuse to compete in such a way that, that someone must lose in order for us to win, we can trust in God's world where there is enough for everyone. We have the opportunity to let go of expectations based on what we think others deserve, to make no judgments of, on, on ourselves or on others, and that is the way of grace, the way of God. Imagine if we all let go of comparison and competition and expectation and judgment. <laughs> would give us so much room to be filled by God's grace. And then being filled by God's grace, it would make space for others to be God-filled as well. And the world would, the parable tells us, begin to look a lot like the kingdom of heaven. It wouldn't be fair. But thank God it wouldn't be fair. Glory be to God. Amen. Please sing with us our number three spot. It's in the green book. You want to turn to that? It's 3033. Not a great, a lot of small.
as we come to a time of offering this morning, we give thanks for all of the gifts that God has given us. For the talents and, and the graces that we have, and for all of the all of the things that we have in our lives, God is the provider of all good gifts. And so now we give back only a portion in return and in thanksgiving. Will the ushers please come forward? resources and um, they're, they're doing their best um, but we are very hopeful that, that Kelly will be able to be seen um, by a medical professional who will have the time and resources to devote to her so that she can she can be uh, receive some some relief from the vertigo um, so let's lift up and, and, and be mindful of Kelly this week uh, Lord in your mercy hear our prayers what other joys and concerns do we bring today
Nice to have the cool weather. Yes, oh my gosh, certainly, certainly nice to have the cool weather. Uh, I've been much more likely to go outside and grab my dogs, um, <laughs> as long as it's been a little bit dry. Right? Uh, we'll thank God for that. Lord in your mercy, we are our prayer. Dorothy. Um, we should continue to pray for the hurricane victims and also for for the hurricane victims and for the people of Afghanistan, we'll keep all of them in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I think we'd like to add our teachers uh, to, to the list of ongoing prayers. Um, teachers are, you know, uh, in a situation that is not normal for them. Um, being a teacher is hard enough to begin with, um, and to, to throw in everything that's going on in the world right now, um, and to add that to their plate is. Is we're asking quite a bit of them. Uh, so we give thanks for our teachers and we hold them in our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Do we have a report on our, our church baby? <laughs> our precious little princess. Do you want to hear about the princess? Yes. <laughs> She's coming home this week. I, I don't know the end, but that, is, that was the latest from the doctor yesterday morning. He said there's no reason to keep her here. They are, uh, they did give her a blood transfusion, and um, they will go ahead. They'll probably keep her through Tuesday because they are still uh, monitoring and giving her her brain scans on Tuesday morning. Um, but right now, her feeding tube is out. She's been eating tremendously, uh, doing wonderful with her feedings and all of that. So they said that it's, it's uh, you know, time to come home. They will probably send her home with some oxygen uh, just uh, because she's still working with that and that's a lot, of, it's a lot of work to eat and a lot of work, I mean when she goes to sleep, it goes down. I mean it's just what we do. Our bodies, miraculous bodies that we have that now I really understand the miracles of what our good Lord has given us. So thank you all so much for your prayers and keep them in your prayers as we go through this part of our journey. We're all terrified. Um, but we're also so excited. And also, I want to bring up uh, my family lost uh, my Uncle Gene this week, which was kind of sad. So, Daddy had another brother join him in heaven this week. So, pray for our family because Uncle Gerald is, he's a little sad. He's lost two brothers. So, that's a lot of joy, a lot of, a lot yeah. of grief, um, and a lot more uh, coming for your family. So, yeah. um, we'll keep your entire family. Lord, in your mercy, what other joys and concerns do we bring this week? Yes. Well, uh, my husband had a kidney infection. He had a fever of 104. Yes, we went to the doctor, no COVID or anything. And he's had kidney stones before about six years ago. And um, he had some imaging done. Went to see the urologist the other day. And he said, oh, I can't see what they're talking about, the six millimeter kidney stone. Let's go get some clear images. And hopefully this coming week they'll make an appointment for that. But let's just pray they don't see that kidney stone. Right, right. All right, so uh, prayers for your husband. And, and your husband's name again is? Robert, thank you. I got stuck on your brother Mark, uh, and I did not want to make that mistake. Um, so, Robert, all right, thank you. Um, we'll keep Robert in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's go to God in a time of silent prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the opportunities of work. You told us from the very beginning that we would earn our bread by the sweat of our brow, but we are also interdependent in our laboring, Lord. We depend on the migrant workers who pick our lettuce and our strawberries, the nurse's aide who empties the bedpans, the teachers who form our children's minds. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts and talents you have given us that allow us to earn a living and contribute something positive to our world. We pray, dear Lord, for those who are without work. Sustain them and us in your love. Help us to realize that we have worth as human beings 
job or no job. But that's hard to get, Lord. Our society preaches to us that our worth comes from success, of keeping up with the Joneses. But our worth comes because you made us. We are your children. No matter what, job or no job, you love us and you call us to love and support each other. We pray, Lord, for those on whose labor we depend, those who break their backs for us, those who are cheated out of even a minimum wage, those who have no access to health care, those who have been robbed of the resources needed to improve their material conditions, to be able to make a difference for their lives, the lives of their families, and the lives of their neighbors. Help us to realize this weekend how dependent we are on one another. We are one. We are family. We need each other. Let us give thanks for each other on this Labor Day weekend. Lord, help us to celebrate and give thanks for each other and appreciate the value, the dignity, and the contribution that each one makes to keep our country, our cities, and our lives going. And in tough times, help us to remember the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. And so we come now to your son, remembering the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us stand and sing our closing song. Amen. Yeah.